And we are live. Uh, welcome everybody to a very special first time edition uh, webinar. It's a financial model teardown. Yes, a teardown. Uh, we will be getting into more details about what that actually entails. But before we dive in, uh, welcome everybody. Um, we have kind of a, a ritual at all CFO Connect webinars where we ask people where they're tuning in from in the world because we have quite a global far-reaching community. Um, so thank you, uh, thank you, Aline, for the feedback about the echo. Um, I think it's my room, so I'll try to I'll try to make it less echoey. Um, so if the if the community could could please uh, just drop in the chat where you're tuning in from, uh, would be great to, to see all, all the names and faces and, and countries that people are tuning in from. So so Rafael from from Porto. Alexander from Bulgaria, um, Ian, yes, from Toronto. Hopefully it's not too cold there. You're seeing a bit of sun. Uh, we've got Juan from Argentina, uh, Annie from Berlin. I'm also based in Berlin, so hello, Annie. Michael from Hamburg, uh, Adrian from Spain, Svetlana from Bali. She's living life. Uh, I think we're all jealous there. Uh, Matthew from London, Valentin from Paris. So yes, thank you everybody for tuning in. It sounds like we have quite the diverse and global crowd for this very first teardown. Um, for those of you who do not know CFO Connect, uh, we're a global community of over 10,000 finance leaders. We offer webinars like this one. We have a vibrant Slack community and we have insightful reports on our blog that you can check out. And CFO Connect is powered by Spendesk, which is a spend management platform that gives you fine, that gives finance leaders full visibility to make smarter decisions. So just a few housekeeping notes before we get started. Uh, this session is being recorded and we'll send you a recording afterwards. Um, and please use the Q&A tab on the right-hand panel to ask questions, upvote your favorites so that we can get started. Um, and with that, um, I'm going to hand it over to Ian to tell you more about what is this special teardown concept and how it's going to go down. So Ian, handing the mic over to you. Amazing. Thank you, Luke. And can you hear me okay? Sounds like you can. Uh, hi, everyone. It's great to be back. This is the second webinar that I am doing here uh, for CFO Connect. I'm thrilled to be back here with all of you. When you see me looking over to my right this way, I'm looking at you. I've got a big giant screen and I can see all of you. And this is where my chat is. And I can see a list of where everyone is a big, big number of you, um, which is amazing. Great to see where all of you are from. And those of you in Asia, wow, it's late there. It's um, got to be close to midnight right now. So Welcome. Can you hear me okay? Um, I know, uh, Aleem, you mentioned that there was a bit of um, feedback on Luke's. So Are you getting any? Can you guys, I know there's no thumbs. I'm a big Zoom user. Uh, I'm less familiar with this platform, but you can hear me well. Awesome. Good. Thank you. I love it. And that's not, but not a lot of um, delay there. That's great. Here's what I'd love to do. Um, I am going to be running through this financial model teardown today. I'm going to tell you exactly what we're going to be doing. We're going to be looking at a few models and I'm gonna share a bunch of notes. We're gonna move fast. And, um, but I like to keep these sessions interactive. So this is not just about um, listening. Ooh, Fanny, you have a, you found a thumb there as well. I love that. Is that a thumbs up? Love it. Um, and uh, does everyone see that? Uh, I like to keep these things interactive and engaging. Uh, so I really like a lot of participation. If you've got comments, um, please feel free to toss them into the chat. If you have a longer question, it might make sense to put that into the Q&A and I will do my best to bounce back and forth a little bit um, as we go through here. So let me get right into it. We've got an hour, uh, less than an hour, just under an hour here. So let me go ahead and share my screen. I want to tell you a little bit about who I am, a quick intro, and then dive into today's session. Should be a lot of fun. And, um, and let's get started here. So I'm going to share my screen. Uh, I'm going to share my screen here and now this should be working. There it is. And can, um, uh, appears that it's working. Can someone just give me a thumbs up? I want to make sure that you're seeing my screen. Okay. Uh, it looks like that is so, um, you can see the slides here. Perfect. Awesome. Love it. Thank you, Ben, go ahead and wrap it up. Great. Fantastic. Um, let's dive in a financial model teardown. So I'm going to be moving 
back and forth between a few different presentation materials. I have a set of slides. These slides, I'm not going to spend much time in the slides, but they are here for you and we will send them to you after. I also have a notes file. I'm going to be keeping a bunch of notes in an Excel spreadsheet and th these will also be um, available. Uh, and I want to kind of leave you with a whole bunch of ideas and tips. And then I'm also going to be opening up a bunch of models and showing you some models and critiquing them and sort of tearing them down here. So let me quickly dive in and tell you a little bit about who I am, why I'm doing this, and then get into the models. Okay. So let's come back to my slides here. So very, very quickly, I am Ian Schnur. I am executive director of the Financial Modeling Institute. We are a global financial modeling accreditation organization. If you are building models in your life, if you want to build better models, if you want to truly feel like you have exceptional modeling skills, you're welcome to join us. Uh, we'd love to have you join us in our community. FMI, as we call ourselves, is the only financial modeling accreditation organization in the world. Um, <clears throat> any of our candidates who join us are joining us because they want to access our learning materials, but ultimately, are wanting to get accredited. Um, our exams are very challenging and rigorous. Our first level program is called the AFM program, where you actually have to build up a proper full three statement model of a company from scratch. Um, a beautiful best in class model from scratch. It's a proctored exam under, uh, it's a four hour exam that's done virtually. And uh, if you're interested in learning more about that, feel free to check out our website. Uh, we'd love to have you join us. There's also a discount code here uh, on the slide for those of you who are in today's webinar as part of CFO Connect. So feel free to check us out. You're also welcome to follow me on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm often posting videos and different modeling topics, so feel free to, to follow me if you like. In a nutshell, I have been spending my entire career doing financial modeling, thinking about financial modeling. Um, I <clears throat> started my career as an investment banker. I worked for a number of years in banking, doing traditional M&A work and a lot of valuation work and a lot of modeling work. 20 years ago, I started a training firm called the Marquee Group, and I trained people all over the world for, I think I trained well over 20,000 people for over 20 years. I sold that business last year to um, Training the Street, which is a very large uh, global financial training firm. And now I spend all my time as executive director of Financial Modeling Institute and thrilled to have you here today. And we run lots of free webinars all over the world to help people boost their skills and, and their confidence in modeling. So that's a little bit about who we are. Let me tell you, and again, there's some slides in here about how, how we work and how our exams work if you are interested. But let me dive in and tell you a little bit what today's session goal is. The goal today, uh, the goal is uh, for you to learn some tips and best practices from me reviewing some other models. I'm going to share some other models with you. And in doing so, what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep a big list. I'm going to keep a big list here of best practices. And we're going to talk about them um, as we go into these models. And I'm going to show you what's working well and what's not working well in some of the models. In fact, I'm going to can pretty much guarantee I can pretty much guarantee that the tips I show you today or some of the issues that we encounter in the models we look at today, they will be issues you have seen before. And if you can learn from them, then um, then then hopefully you'll be able to build and, and have better models in your teams, in your work, um, you know, for all of your colleagues. By the way, I was here with Luke and CFO Connect in January. And in January, um, in January, I led a um, session on skills to check a model. And I'm telling you that because apparently Luke tells me it's on YouTube. So if you are interested, if you like today's session and you want to see a session I do on very specific skills to check a financial model, I shared with the group some of my top 10 skills tools and tips and skills to check models, um, feel free to, I don't know if Luke has a link for that one, but if not, you can probably find it on YouTube. And that is, you know, obviously free if you want to check that out as well. So let's talk about, um, let's talk about, let's spend one or two minutes talking about some best practices. And then we'll use that um, 
to get to our model. Oh, super. Thank you, Ben. Ben has just tossed it in there. Um, I didn't even have that, so I should copy that link as well. If you take a look at the chat, if you want to just click on that, you can check it out later if you're interested in, in, uh, in seeing that a little bit later on. Okay. So first of all, financial model, best practice. Let me just spend one or two minutes here because I have entire webinars. I have entire webinars on best practices, and we're going to touch on some of them today. But really, I just want to leave you with a few quick um, comments. First of all, of course, financial model. A financial model is simply a forecast. You know that. It's simply a forecast, usually of a company, um, usually of a company's financial statements. All we're trying to do is build a forecast, but it has to be much more than that. And if you've ever met me or seen a webinar with me before, you may know that I that I often like to say that most models are a mess. Most models are a mess. They don't work very well. A lot of models people struggle with. And I'm going to show you some models today that people have really struggled with. They're, they're not well designed. They're not well built. Most financial models are a mess um, because people don't understand financial modeling discipline very well. And I will tell you that a good model needs to create confidence. And it needs to be, um, and we'll see if our models do this, a powerful communication tool. A model is not simply a giant calculator. A good model has to create confidence. It has to be a very, very powerful communication tool. It has to tell a story. And I like to tell people that a good model needs to work in two different ways. And I'm telling you this because we will look at this when we get into the models we get to today. Number one, um, a good model has to work well electronically, which simply means that every formula must make sense. Every formula must make sense. It has to be um, logical and obvious. When you click on every formula in a model, it has to be clean and clear and obvious. Um, you should be able to understand it. You should be able to follow it. In fact, quick question. Has anybody here ever opened up a spreadsheet that you did not build and you clicked on a cell and you clicked on a formula and the formula wrapped around and around and around. has anyone ever seen, do me a favor, raise your thumb if you've ever seen a formula that was so long that it wrapped around and around with all sorts of cell references all over the course. Anna says, of course you have. Well, I want to avoid that. That is not optimal. That is not ideal, right? You've seen that. Of course you've seen that. I'm not surprised. I love all the thumbs coming up. Not ideal. A good model. Um, and by the way, if you ever see a formula that is doing that, wrapping around, don't feel bad. It's not your fault. It should have been built more effectively, more efficiently. I'm going to show you how to do that in today's session. So a good model needs to work well electronically, and it needs to work well on paper or um, as a PDF. It's got to work well as a PDF so that you can present it, so that you can communicate it. So those are a couple of criteria. Let me show you back in our slides here. Uh, let me go back into our slides. I'm going to show you a few criteria that I like to use to evaluate models. And you'll see this. You're going to get sent the slides. Um, first of all, how do I like to evaluate models? Well, first of all, there's first impressions, right? First impressions are important. First impressions when you meet somebody are important. First impressions when you see anything are important. And when you look at a model is no exception. The first impression you get is going to go a long way. Another thing we want to think about when we evaluate a model is the flow. And I will tell you that there's an optimal flow. Models often have an optimal flow because it has to do with the way we communicate and the way we deliver information. A good model can often have a cover sheet. Um, an executive summary is very, very helpful because it, dis it communicates the answer. Why are we here? What's the purpose of this model? A good model has some assumptions to communicate um, what we, our inputs were. And then it has a variety of schedules and then some sorts of statements. So how is the flow? When I'm looking at a model, I try to get a first impression. I try to look at model flow. Then I will dive into things like formula construction. How was the formulas built? How were they constructed? Was it clean? Is it easy to follow? Does it communicate clearly? Does it tell a story? Does it convey the appropriate information? And overall, uh, ultimately, is it accurate? Are there any errors? Does it create confidence? And so this isn't everything. And if you have other ideas as well of things you like to think about for criteria, feel free to toss them in. 
But these are the types of things I like to look at when I'm evaluating somebody's model. And so um, that's here. By the way, the next few slides, by the way, if you, if you, when you get the slides, the next few slides happen to include a bunch of pages on tips, tips to check models. So I'm not going to go through these slide by slide, but when you receive the slides, they are here. Some really great tips for you. So I want to start by showing you, believe it or not, I want to show you, so this is what we're trying to do. And when I, um, when I go through, I'm going to show you how we're going to use some very powerful skills to look at a good at model. To start, I want to show you, I'm going to show you one of the all time worst models I have ever seen. Are you up for that? Is anyone interested in that? I, I don't, um, because I don't want you to feel bad about your, your own model. I actually want to make you, but when you see this model, I think you're all going to feel pretty good about yourself because there's no way your models look this bad, or maybe someone else on your team built them like this, but not you. Um, so let's take, <laughs> let's take a look here at one of the worst models that I ever saw of all time. This was a model uh, built by an engineer uh, at a large steel company, a large steel manufacturing business. And this was a model built to evaluate the business. So I'm gonna open this up and by doing so, you're gonna see here what happened. Um, let's take a look here. I am gonna go in, you can't see my screen right now, but I am gonna open up and I'm gonna spend one moment on this. This is a steel model here. And I want you to see um, what's going on. First of all, I've opened up this model. We're, not, we're only gonna spend a couple minutes here because I don't wanna spend most of our time. I don't wanna spend most of our time on, um, on a horrible model. Um, and I actually, I actually condensed it down to two sheets. So when I open up this model, you can see here that there's a summary sheet. Okay. And then there is a sheet that says uh, 5Q1, whatever that means. Now, the first thing you'll notice, though, is it says, hey, there are one or more circular references. Has anyone ever opened up a spreadsheet and got this message saying, and, 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 the first, and within five seconds, you're having a minor panic attack, like your heart's starting to beat faster. You're like, what's going on here? There's circular references. Anyone seen that before? Of course you have. It's not a good way. It's not a great look to start, <laughs> to start opening a, a file in a model and it says there's circular reference. Okay, now, circular reference are not always bad. They're not all bad, but I don't wanna open the model and immediately get this message. By the way, so by the way, uh, it says, okay, I gotta click okay to get rid of that. Um, if there are, um, if you probably know this, if there are circular references, you need to enable, um, iterations okay you need to enable excel's iterations so you're going to go to the file menu options formulas and then i'm, I'm going to show you enable iteration so watch this okay i'll do it with my mouse so you can see what i'm doing i'm going to go to file menu i'm going to go all the way down to options you can see this file options into the formulas and one i will turn on enable iterative calculations and i will click okay all right i'll click okay so that's just going to tell me that, that that's just giving Excel permission to think about and to deal with and to, un, to deal with the circularity. I don't know why the circularity is here yet in this model, but it is. By the way, does anybody know? Does anybody know if you ever open up a spreadsheet? Does anybody here know how to tell if a financial model has a circular reference in it? I'm looking. I'm looking at you now. Does anyone know how you can determine if a spreadsheet contains a circular reference? You might have gotten the message I just got, but if I if the iteration setting was already on, if the iteration setting was already on, you would not have gotten that message when you opened the file. Does anybody know how to tell right now that my Excel spreadsheet has a, I'm gonna go back to the steel model. Does anyone know how to tell right now that this model has a circular reference in it. You should check this. Um, yes, thank you. I can see bottom left rib. What are, exactly? But what? What am I looking for? Um, it is. I see Polly and Mike have said bottom left. What am I looking for exactly in the bottom left? How do I know that there is a circular reference? You're right. What exactly am I looking for? Um, it says cell reference when the iteration is off. Cl yeah, you're getting close. You're getting really warm here. What we're looking for, by the way, and this is important because you should, you might all be surprised that some of your models have circular references, is it says calculate in the bottom left-hand corner. Does everyone see that? 
If it says calculate in the bottom left-hand corner of my screen, do you see that here? I think you do. I think you do. Um, let me just make this a little bit. You see here, right there in the bottom left-hand corner, it says calculate. So that means that there's a circular reference in the file. Um, and when Excel says calculate in the bottom left corner, there is a circular reference in the file. Okay, good. Um, can I hide the sharing screen bar? I, um, which, oh, this thing here, this thing here, is, is this what you're talking about? I, uh, oh, good. Is that better? Yeah, I moved it to my other screen. Is that better? Can you, um, Ian, another Ian. I don't always get a lot of Ian's. Is that better than Ian? I hope that that worked better. Good. I think that's what you're talking about. Perfect. Uh, there is, oh, there's a hide button in it too. Look at that. See, I'm not a splash user. I am not a splash user. Thank you for these splash tips. That is, uh, that is helpful. Thank you. And now it's gone. Perfect. Hopefully gone forever. Now, when it says calculate, now let me just show you something. Let me show you something in this, um, model here. Here's tip one. Here's tip one. Uh, whenever I look at a model, whenever I look at a model, the first thing I always do is zoom down. I like to zoom down, i.e. to 30%, oops, 30% or 40%. Every time I ever open up a new financial model, the very first thing I do is I like to zoom down. And by the way, if you want to know the keyboard shortcut for that, is I like to go Alt V and then the letter Z. Alt V Z. Think of it as view zoom view the zoom menu alt v z watch this then if i do that if i go to this model i'm gonna go alt and i like to go or you can go here or you can go alt w alt w and then q alt w q also works i like alt v z because it's more obvious to me view the zoom window but let me put the current one as well or alt W and then the Q. Try that. If you're working in Excel right now, try this. Go Alt W Q or Alt V Z. Pops open the zoom menu. Now watch this, please. Watch what happens here when I go to the zoom menu and I'm going to go down to let's say 50%. So I'm in this steel model. I'm going to go down to 50. Hmm, okay, it's getting small, but I can still, I want to be able to see a lot. So I'm it's it's not small enough. I'm going to make it smaller. Watch this. I'm going to go down to let's say 40. Hmm. I, and I don't want to be able to read the numbers. I want to be able to get a perspective on how this model's built. Let me go smaller, 30. It's still going all the way off to the side here. Let me do it one more time to 25. This model is still going, look at this. It's going way off to the right, but that's not the biggest problem. The biggest issue is that it is going down. Look how deep this thing goes down. It's going and going. This is the summary sheet. It's going and going and going. This is like a C. This is like a giant C oh, of, of numbers and models. And this is the summary sheet. Now let's try this on the, it's down and down and down. What a summary that is, right? This is an encyclopedia. Um, this goes down to row 1,000 for the summary sheet. The actual model, first of all, is populated. There's errors all over the place. Watch this. I'm going to go down to, um, I'm going to go down to, again, let's say 40%. And as I scroll down, you can see this model is designed horribly. It's a mess. There's stuff everywhere. As I scroll down, um, there's data left, center, right. There's no method to the madness. And I will show you this. I want you to see what happens. Um, also, there are some accidental circular references. Watch this. I'm going to show you um, if you want to see, if you want to find, if you if you want to trace the circular references in a model, turn off the iterations. I'm going to do this for a moment and then get back to some better models. Turn off the iterations because I want you to see here how you might catch this in some of your own models. If you want to trace the circs, turn off the iterations and watch. So I'll do that. I'll go back to the file menu. I'm going to go to options and I'm going to turn off this iteration capability, click OK. And it said, now it says it can't resolve them. That's OK. So let's go back into the model now. Once you go back into the model, I'm going to go to 
I'm going to go to formulas. Once you turn off the iteration, you can go to formulas, error checking, and you can look for all the circular references. So watch this. So now I'm going to go, oops. So now then go, then I'm going to say go to formulas, uh, error checking, and look for circular references. So let's see them here, OK? So I'm going to go here to the formula menu. I'm going to click on error checking. And let's see where all these circular references are. Let me go to one. Let me go to one. OK. Um, and you can see here, I'll make it a little bit. I, and don't worry about the numbers. I just want you to see that in this particular spot, there's a cell here. This red cell is based on these cells underneath it. And this cell is based on the one on top. So they refer to each other. So that's obviously an error. Um, I'm going to show you another one. Has anyone ever seen this before? This is kind of funny. I think you're going to enjoy this. If I go here and look at the next circular reference, watch this. It's like a box. I have like a giant loop, an infinite loop. Look, there's a huge blue chain of cells that are, has anyone ever encountered this, this in a model? Stuff that's going all the way down. Look at this. It's like a, it's like I'm making a little dance move here. There's just stuff everywhere. Every one of these blue dots is reconnecting and talking. And as I delete one, the formulas fly off to the side. This is a disaster. This model is a horrible mess. This was built. This is a classic example. I'm going to close it. This model, uh, steel model, is a classic example of a model that was built by a, a person for him or herself. Um, no thinking around, uh, it's a giant messy calculator. Nobody could read it, nobody can understand it. It is an awful mess and it was built you know, over many years and it's a, and it's a terrible mess. There's not much you can do uh, about models like that other than try to start again and rebuild them because this would take you years to properly understand what's happening. And I hope you don't encounter models like this, but there are lots of models in the world like this um, that, that are very dangerous. They're very, very dangerous because they, they, they surely contain errors and don't work properly. And, and they are heavily dependent uh, on one person, right? A good model, a good model should be transferable, i.e. not dependent on one person to update it. Has anyone ever, I'm going to ask you, has anyone ever uh, encountered a model on your teams where you needed one guy, one person, you know, uh, let's say it was Ian. Ian had to update it because he was the only one who could ever update the file. That is not a telltale sign of a good model. Um, a good model, let's see, one of them, yeah, huh. Anna says, one of my CFOs used to build, it's always the CFOs. No, just kidding. Just kidding. One of my CFOs used to build monsters like this. We had to scrap them all when he left. Yeah, do you see that? So um, thank you, Anna. I'm reading Anna's comment here. Thank you for the, putting that in. Anna says that one of her CFOs used to build monsters like this. They exist, right, Anna? So now you believe me. I didn't make that up. And I hope you've all encountered it because, and you had to scrap them. There's really no way to get around it other than to rebuild them because they were built by a person for that person. It's not optimal. And if you encounter models like that, you're better off to try and think about using the ideas, but you need to make sure your models work effectively as a communication tool, as a presentation tool. If they do, they will be highly usable and create tremendous confidence. I'm going to wrap up today's with what I think is a good, um, <laughs> um, the, uh, Ian says that was that was his entire career before you built some crazy ones. Exactly. Um, you, <laughs> um, so let's get on. Let's move on then to let's move on to the next one is I want to show you next. Um, we're going to look at a model that was submitted. Let's look at a model that was at a simple model. That was submitted. For this webinar okay i'm going to show you a simpler model that was that was submitted for today's webinar this is a cleaner simpler model and it's not bad it's not bad there's some room for improvement but let's take a look here okay so first of all 
first of all, what I want you to see is I've opened up this model. I don't know who the company is. And by the way, by the way, if anyone ever, this is something I do a fair bit and I will be doing as well. If you want to send me a model to critique, um, I'm happy to do that. I'm happy to do that. I might post you know, a video on it. Um, however, it will be unrecognizable. Um, you can see that I have no idea. I never, if you ever send me a model to look at, I don't, care what the company is. I don't want to know what the company is. I don't need to know their name. You can change numbers. That's not relevant. If I'm looking at models, it's to look at the structure. It's to look at the design. It's to look at the formula construction. I don't want to know who it is. I don't want any sensitive details. So here's the thing. I just opened up this model and I want to show you something. Look what happened. I can see that there's some nice tabs on the bottom of it. But when, when let's pretend I'm the client. When I opened it up, the cursor is way off here in cell T16. The cursor is off here in cell T16. Um, on the I'm kind of in the middle. I'm on the middle of it. My strong tip is when you are, um, it's, you know, when saving a model, put your cursor on, um, on the cover page so it opens nicely on the cover, right? It, it's much nicer to open up a model and be here, to be on the cover. And then when you, sh when you change sheets, um, you are automatically moving from sheet to sheet nicely, like opening up the beginning of a presentation. So that's one thing here. Now, um, so the, I can see this model, whatever it was, whoever sent it in, changed the name, uh, took off the company name, which is great. So I would prefer um, I'm going to do this. I'm going to give you some feedback on this particular model. The second thing, though, I will say is uh, the company name, the company name should only ever be entered once, and then it should be linked everywhere else. So look at this. Let's let's put in. Let's go back to this model here. Let's type in a. Let's call it ABC um, Company. Whatever. So I'm typing in the company name there. Now I would hope that that flows through everywhere, um, but it's not. It's not. It still says company name here on the assumption page. It says company name. That that suggests to me. It, and and I might be wrong about this. It suggests to me that this person might have typed in the name numerous times, um, and that's not ideal, right? Ideally, the name should only be typed once. So if you type it in in the first instance, then everywhere else, it should simply be linked back. And I will link it to back to the cover sheet. And then this one can either go back to the cover or back to the previous sheet. I really don't care. But the point is, if you change it, uh, if you change this to make it XXXX company, I obviously want the company name to update. The name should only be typed in once. On any company, the name should be entered once. Um, so you want, you may, you may want to be able to reuse your model. You may want to change the name. Um, the right, <laughs> uh, exactly. And so I see someone is also mentioning it is a very strong discipline to get into when you save your models. Put the cursor on the cover page in cell A1, um, in cell A1. Also, have cursor in A1 uh, on every sheet. It just feels nice when you open up a file and you suddenly know that as you open it, the cursor is automatically, this is what, I, before I save any file, before I save any file, I make sure the cursor is in the top corner of every cell, of every sheet, and that when my user opens it, they're opening it onto the cover. I wouldn't email someone a PowerPoint and have it open up onto page 19. I don't think you can even do that. But I don't, it, it would not be very nice to look at a PowerPoint deck and start on slide, you know, nine or 19. So that's a simple one. Now, um, that is here on the cover. Let's take a look at, um, let's take a look at the flow. The flow is not bad. The flow in this model is, the flow is pretty good. The flow is good. It's actually got a cover. It's got a summary page. It's got assumptions. And then it's got them all. I see that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But it's missing. It's missing one critical piece, right? So the model has the cover. 
It's got an executive summary. It's got some assumptions. Philosophically, this is what I want to see. And then the model is here. I'm going to show you a couple of, I'm going to show you a couple of room for improvement, areas to improve just on this model. And then I want to turn my attention to a model that was struggling uh, more than this one. Um, I'm going to provide some additional feedback on this one. The first one is this. So there is a summary sheet. There's a summary page here, which is fine. But the one thing I notice about this summary page, it's only running one case. I've got an executive summary, and you can see the numbers are coming off the model sheet, which is good, which is good. But I'm only running one case. Um, and I will tell you, I will tell you that one of the most important elements to include in every model is a scenarios page. A scenarios page, um, it allows you to manage risk and volatility. So on a scenario page, I want to see, uh, a scenario page allows me to have, um, sorry, allows you to have a base case, a best case, a worst case for the key variables. And that is something that I would want to do. And therefore, on the executive summary, it would be nice if we could see, um, wouldn't it be nice if we could see the, what are the answers running the, what is the revenue and the expenses and the margins under the base case? And then one more time, it'd be nice to see it under the, the best case and then do the same thing under the worst case. It's really helpful to manage uncertainty. And so, um, and, and as a result, then the summary page can summarize on base, best, uh, worst. And in the, um, I will take a look here. Uh, I will take a look at one of the models that we will send out in our Henderson model, which I'm going to open up for you right now. I just, I'm not, I don't have a chance today to show it to you. However, if you look at another model, I'm going to show you. If you look at another model here that I want to show you, I turn on the iterations again, very briefly, watch this. If you take a look here, please, at this other. So let's go back. Sorry, let's go back to let's go back to the sample model. The sample has a cover, an executive summary. It has assumptions and then there's a model sheet. OK, fine. In the Henderson model that I just opened up that we will send off. This is a sample model. This is a sample model that we use at FMI. This is the type of model we expect people to build during the AFM exam, the advanced financial model exam. We have a summary, assumptions, but there's a scenarios page. And I encourage you to look at this. This page allows me to run a base case, a best case, and a worst case, to run upside cases and downside cases. And, um, and it allows me, as a result, to summarize the model, to summarize the model under a base case and under a best case and under a worst case. And so it's very, very powerful to have that. Henderson model has this. You can also search on YouTube for my uh, webinars on financial modeling best practices, where I show people how to build a scenario page. So that's one um, that's one piece of feedback that I would encourage for whoever built this model is have um, scenarios. Scenarios are critical in any model. The next thing I want to talk about is the assumption page. So I, I, I applaud you. I think it's excellent. I think it's excellent that you have um, an assumption page because that tells me what your inputs are. I'm going to show you a really powerful keyboard shortcut right now. Um, I am going to show you a really powerful keyboard shortcut that I think you're going to like. And it has to do with this. Can everyone see here that the user of this model, uh, I like this a lot, has told me that blue are for inputs. And formulas are black. I like that. Blues, and that's great. I strongly encourage that. I strongly encourage that. Blue are input cells, black are formulas. And by the way, um, that is an excellent best practices. That's an excellent best practice. So, as a best practice, I would say blue is inputs and 
black our formulas just like the person did in this model excellent okay by the way watch this can everyone see that i typed in a number i want to show you something you're going to like this do you see i typed in a number four or five i just typed in a number here well it's black right if i want to make it blue watch this i can make it blue if i want to make it red i made it red if i want to make it black again look at that i made it black you want some yellow shading i added some yellow shading it is very powerful to know how to change colors quickly and i will show you um, if you want i don't have i'm not going to do it in this webinar but watch my linkedin video it's free on how to quickly change colors using the quick access toolbar um, link above the link is here above in this notes file in my notes file i have a video that i have got a lot of great feedback on it i'll just click it if you want to see it here in fact um in fact i will even just if you're interested i will toss it into um i will toss it into the um into the chat this is a really great video that people like on how do you quickly, quickly change colors if you want to adhere to color coding. There's a great best practice on how to do that. I'm going to stop for a second. Um, I'm going to stop for a second and take a couple questions here because I see some really great questions. Um, Marie has said, let's go back here. Marie has said, let's go back to the, the Johnny model here. Marie has said, what if the company name is a logo? Excellent question. I love it. What if the company name is a logo? Um, no problem. But a logo would only go in once. Let's pretend that the logo was here. Okay. Let's pretend that the logo was there. Okay. No problem. Uh, Marie, if the logo was there, I still, in every model that I've ever built in my life, I would still always have the company name typed in. Always type the company name, even if you have the logo. As an example, Marie, if you take a look at this, in the Henderson model, in the Henderson model, I have a logo. This is the, the FMI logo. The logo is here, but I still have a company name Henderson that shows up on every single page. So um, here, and it links back, right? The name Henderson, every single page. I, I type the company name, but it is very nice to have logos up front. I agree with you. I just, I would just make sure that you're still typing in a company name as well. So there's nothing wrong with logos. I love logos on a cover, but the logo would usually just show up once. Um, do I recommend, Anthony has said, do I recommend a scenario page for a fundraising model? I understand the use case for scenario planning, but is it something to share with potential investors? Um, it's an excellent question. A hundred percent, a hundred percent, every single, if it's a fundraising model, I 100% you encourage you to include a scenario page. I will tell you why. Oops. I will tell you why. Let's pretend let's pretend we were using this model and for henderson to raise some money okay henderson wanted to raise more money i will tell you why because what it does is it clearly it sends a signal to prospective investors that you understand the key drivers that you understand which are the most sensitive volatile elements um, of your business which assumptions in your business are going to be volatile which might be hard to forecast and which ones are more predictable there are always variables that are hard to forecast and hard to control you could even do this you could have a base case a best case and a worst case and then you could do something like um you could do something like user case if you want and then you could do this you could allow your user you see that um you could allow the user to type in you know their own input case so that when you send it to prospective investors they can they're going to play with it anyway they're going to play with all these numbers anyway the point is this demonstrates that you're thinking about where the volatility is going to come from they're going to want to play with it i promise you they're going to want to play with upside downside cases so you may as well include it but it's an excellent question um how do you see how does it um yeah, I mean, there's a question from um, Rachel. How do you call those scenarios base, best, and worst? How to stay positive and showing? Um, yeah, I think I get the question. I mean, how is trying to so call it something? Uh, you know, you call it. I don't know. I mean, you can call it downside. 
Um, you can call it a downside case. You can call it, um, I mean, the reality is, the reality is, I actually think it's healthy. I think it's healthy to say if things go really badly, uh, often against our control, because um, there might be a huge economic, we might have another pandemic. I don't know what it is, but if something goes really badly, it just shows that you're thinking about what will happen at the company and how you can mitigate risk. So I'm not, um, I don't, I never mind showing people the worst case. It doesn't mean I'm going to do something bad. It means, uh, it means that the environment around me is going to go sideways or go down for a period. And I've just captured what that will look like. Um, so I've never, I've never felt badly about showing a worst case. I will, I, I will tell them what I think is likely and then, you know, name them however you think is, is reasonable. Let's come back then. I'll come back to some more questions after because a lot of great questions here. Let's come back to some other things I want to show you on this model. Um, I told you that there's a summary page here. I'm going to show you. Does everyone want to see a great keyboard shortcut now here? Um, and I'll come back. I'm just looking here. Right. Okay. Interesting. Uh, I'm going to come back to your comment, Polly, in just a second on color blindness. Blue and black. Blue and black are the common colors used. The reason, by the way, the reason why, the reason why, um, the reason why here, the reason why black and blue, black are used is because most people can tell the difference. And you probably even know um, the that it, yeah, there are some people that have color blindness, but the most the most common type of color blindness is red green color blindness. Um, black blue black blue color blindness is a thing. Maybe you know someone that has that. It's just a lot more rare. It's a lot more rare. Most people most people can distinguish model blue. Again, watch this. This is uh, this is model blue versus model black. Um, and it's a nice to be able to indicate which is the input and which is the formula. So that's why these colors are chosen because they are for most people easy to distinguish. Um, and if not, if you do encounter someone who can't tell the difference, you might have to find another way to use shading or something else um, to do that. But there's an issue here. I am going to show you a great keyboard shortcut. Watch this. This is one of my favorite tips. This is a great tip to, to look for inputs in a model, in a model. Watch this one. I'm going to go into this model. I'm going to go back to this model here. Okay. I'm going to go back to the model here and I'm going to go uh, to the assumption sheet and there's a fantastic tip. Watch this. I'm going to press F5. F5 is the go-to key. It says, where do you want to go? I'm going to say go to, I'm going to click special. Uh, a lot of people know that go to, a lot of people know that if you press F5, let me do it again, F5 is the go-to key, okay? F5 is the go-to key. What you might not have ever noticed is that when you go to the go-to button, there's another button that says special. It says, and for some reason, there are special places you can go. Watch what happens when I click go to special. One of my favorite things to do is say go to special and then click constants. Watch what happens. Watch what happens when I click OK. It highlights every single cell in the worksheet that was entered as an input cell. This is very, very powerful because it allows you to identify every single cell that was entered as an input. I do this all the time. I love this technique. I love this tip. It allows me to know if anything was entered as an input that I was not expecting. Like as an example, watch this. Watch if I go to my Henderson model for a second. If I'm in the Henderson model, let's pretend that somebody one day went to revenue and typed in uh, 290, okay? If someone typed in a dead number here, that's not obvious. It's not obvious that that is a typed in number. So I strongly encourage you in every spreadsheet you ever open to go F5, then click on special, and then click on constants. And when you do that, it highlights every single cell and you can go, what the heck is going on? Why is this lighting up? Well, this cell is clearly an input, okay? So I love that, I hope you use that. But let's go back to the model I was just showing you. Something is confusing me here. 
something um, is confusing me here. What's confusing me is that it's highlighting all the cells that were typed in as inputs. But look, the legend says that inputs are blue. Inputs are blue, formulas are black. But these cells are all lighting up. These ones here are all lighting up, but they're black. These ones are black. And this blue one is not lighting up. Let's look at this. So here is a black number. Wait a second. This is a black number, but it's an input. The legend's wrong. It's not working correctly. This is an, these are all input cells, but they should be blue, but they're not. They're black. And the total is actually a formula and it's blue, but this one should have been black. So the colors got reversed. And it's actually very problematic when you reverse the colors. And in this model, I noticed there's a few places where the colors got reversed. So again, if it's um, an input cell, it should be um, blue. And if it's a formula, it should be black. And a great way to find that one more time is F5 special constants. And when I click OK, you can see here it's happened a few occasions. Like, look, these black cells are all lighting up. Um, but you can see the fact that they're being highlighted means that they're input cells and they should be blue. Likewise, these blue ones are not lighting up, which means this must be a formula. It is. So one more time, there's a bit of an inconsistency there. And I will now show you one more tip on this model. Um, and then I'll probably be turning it back. I think that's all we're going to get through. I'm going to turn it back to, um, to, to Luke. So look what's going on here. I really like something in this model. And this is a skill that you can use all the time. Uh, look what this person did. I love this. And I will uh, give this person a lot of, a lot of props for this. Um, my strong recommendation, one of my strong, strong recommendations is uh, one of the best ways, oops, let me go back to my notes. One of the best ways to build a powerful model, one of the best ways to build and construct a powerful, easy to understand model is to use a concept called, and here's the, the called, um, one of my favorite concepts that I've coined, repeat and link, right? Repeat and link. What that means is first repeat every assumption and then use it in calculations. Repeat every single assumption and then use it in the calculation. And I love that this user did this. Watch, let's go back to this model here. Do you notice in this model, this person has to, is calculating a few things. By the way, whoever built this, I might encourage a little bit more visual space. If this was my model, I might insert some blank rows in between sections. Do you see that here? I inserted a row, I inserted another row, and I inserted another row here. It provides a little bit of visual separation. By the way, does anybody know the great keyboard shortcut? Does anybody know the great keyboard shortcut? And I, um, does anyone know the great keyboard shortcut to insert rows? Mm, it provides a little bit of nice separation. It is, I'll tell you here, insert rows is my favorite way to do it is alt, I, and then the letter R. This is an old fashioned, this is a retro old fashioned keyboard shortcut, alt IR, but I love it um, because it's intuitive. Think of it as insert rows, alt IR. Obviously alt IC also works to insert columns. But I might, I if, I, if this was me, I might've had um, some blank space. I might've made the totals bold, just things to get a little bit of, think about communicating clearly. And, um, but what I love that you did is this. Can everyone see here? What I love that you did is this person is taking the number of hires from G30, assumption G30. They're taking the average fee and then they're multiplying it here. L7 times L8. I love that. I love that you did that because that's not what I see all the time. Do you know what I usually see? Here's what I usually see. Usually what I see is people do not bother to repeat these rows. Usually what people will do is they'll do this. They'll build a formula that looks like this. They'll have 
they'll have, oops, sorry, what people will often do is build long formulas where they'll have a cell linking to a number on one sheet, and then they will have something else also linking to a different sheet. In most people's models, they don't bother repeating the assumptions. So when you click on a cell, you simply see a big, long formula like that. Um, has anyone seen that? Raise your hands. How many of you have seen that? I'm coming back. How many of you have seen giant, long formulas where you're linking to numerous different cells on different sheets? It happens all the time. I'm sure you have. I love, love that whoever built this repeated the assumption, repeated the assumption, and then a tiny formula. And then they did it again. Repeat and repeat and a tiny formula. I love that. This works in every model you will ever build. Repeat, repeat, and a tiny formula. Repeat, repeat, and another tiny formula. And then they've summed it up. Um, and so that discipline, by the way, that is an absolutely critical discipline that I strongly encourage everyone to think about using in your models. Repeat every value, every assumption, and then build teeny tiny calculations. Um, Luke, I'm going to invite you back if you want to come back. Let me take a couple questions here and then give you a chance. Um, yeah, Ahmed said that they love to look for row differences uh, and column differences using, um, uh, watch this keyboard shortcut though, Ahmad. I'll show you this one quickly. Using F5 special constants. If you want to look for row differences, um, you can use, right, you can use F5 special row differences. Uh, however, there's a nice keyboard shortcut. Watch this. Um, so what, what they meant is this, right? Do you see how I have in my model a dead cell here? Well, look, if you're at the very beginning and you want to check and see if they're all exactly the same, you can one more time go F5 special and click on row differences row differences and it will flag the one that's different that's a great way to find it but there's an even better way you can select the row and press control and the backslash above the enter key near the enter key i'm going to put this note here that says or control and the backslash key right so a few tips there. Um, I have I see a couple comments on Google Sheets. I apologize. I am not an expert in Google Sheets. The keyboard shortcuts are different. You know, most uh, there are there are companies using Google Sheets. Of course, there are lots, um, but not nearly as many as use Excel. The keyboard shortcuts are different. I can't work as quickly on Google Sheets. I find that they don't have quite the same alt keys and and usability. So um, there might be some of the what I showed you but I don't, I am not an expert in Google, Google Sheets. Um, is there anything, Luke, do you want to talk about here? we got a, a minute. I know you wanted to wrap things up. There's a lot of questions and, and spend a bit of time on them, but um, maybe I'll yeah. let you, anything you want to talk about before we wrap up here. We're hitting our hour. Yeah, I know, Ian, I was, I'm happy you addressed the, the Google Sheets question because I thought that came up a lot. So, so th thank you for taking that. Um, we do have two questions in the Q&A tab. If you want to tackle those, we, we do have a bit of time, so we, we can extend it. Ha happy to allow you to, to take those as well. Yeah, and I see here. Sure, let me go quickly. Um, most of my companies are using G um, Google Sheets again instead of Excel. Best practice. So first of all, listen, um, first of all, Google Sheets is great. There's nothing wrong with Google Sheets. It's excellent and it gets better all the time. Uh, in fact, they probably made Excel better because Excel has been forced to you know, keep up to, uh, with what some of the, the new ideas that Google Sheets is doing. Uh, you know, I'm actually agnostic. I, I was not. I mean, I did show you a few Excel keyboard shortcuts today, but to be perfectly honest, most of what I'm talking about, everything that I'm talking about today is completely um, agnostic and, and completely applicable to a Google Sheet as well. When you're building a model, it has to be a powerful communication tool. That doesn't matter if it's built in, in, you know, in Apple numbers, in Google Sheets, in Excel. It doesn't matter. A good model has to work in Excel and on paper. This idea I just showed you right now that I liked in the model, repeat and link. Repeat every assumption. Use it in a formula. That's equally relevant to anything you do. 
We can build beautiful models in both. Um, I'm just not as familiar with some of the specific keyboard shortcuts. I don't know if Google Sheets has F5 special constants. They might, um, but, but the vast majority of what I'm talking about in terms of best practices are equally relevant um, in, in Google Sheets. And um, what is my view on column structuring for months and years? Let me show this, your quarterly. Oops. Um, should the years be between the months? Uh, yeah, this is this. Let me talk about this best practice. Let me talk about this best practices. So let's talk about model period. If you, for those of you, who, again, this is being recorded. If you have to drop, but if you do have, um, if you do have a moment, I will show you model periodicity. Right, model periodicity. There's only two ways. There's really two ways to model um, when you are using multiple time periods right i.e if you're using months and quarter or let's just say quarters and years let's just say you're doing quarters and years okay so there's uh option one is to do this has anyone seen this before option one is to have um let's say q1 this is a column for q1 q2 q3 q3 and then Q4, and then what's the next one? What's the next one? You've all seen this, Q1, 2, 3, 4, and then annual, and then they do it again, right? Q1, 2, 3, 4, annual, 1, 2, 3, 4, annual. Has anyone ever seen that? Raise your hand. Has anyone seen a model like that where someone did the periodicity by doing 1, 2, 3, 4, annual, 1, 2, 3, 4, annual, or they did, they did Jan, Feb, March, Right. Or someone has probably I've seen this before as well. Right. Where you've gone Jan, whatever, Feb, uh, March, and then you have Q1 and then you April dot dot dot. Has anyone seen that? You have. Can I tell you how I did? This is how I describe option one. Option one is a disaster. It is a disaster. This is a problem. This is really. A, and it's I understand why people do this. I understand why people do this. But this becomes a disaster in your models um, because when you model like this or like this, it means every third or fourth column has a different formula, right? Um, every third or fourth column is doing something different than the prior ones. So option two is a much cleaner way to deal with periodicity. I always find mistakes. I always find mistakes when people model like this. Option two is to model as follows. Q1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. And then, uh, then below or, or to the right or a different sheet have the annuals, right? It's really the only way to do it. So somewhere else you'll have whatever, then somewhere else in a different sheet, you'll have, you know, 2024, 20, 2025, 20, et cetera. You get the idea. It's very awkward whenever people build models with staggered, inconsistent periodicity. It just, it is. And then what you do is you build a summary sheet. The summary sheet can contain quarters and years, but the actual model uh, calcs should not have them interspersed. It just becomes hard to model and you'll make mistakes. So I do encourage you to avoid that's an excellent question. Um, I, Ian, sorry, sorry to interrupt. I, I think we're, we're a bit over time now. So we're, we're gonna have to wrap up here. But I but, uh, just wanted to say thank you so much. Um, this has been an incredibly dense and informative uh, hour. I, I'm just impressed by the way you, you sped through it and were able to cover so many topics. And I think it's a testament that there's over 100 people here still watching um, after an hour of this. So I, th I think we're all very, very thankful. Um, yeah, thanks for having me in. And very quick, I wanted to pack it in as much because there's a lot of tips. Obviously, people can rewatch it if you want to see things again. And I think this audience understands and will understand what I'm saying. Um, there's a lot more. We could do part two on the next 10 issues and problems in people's minds. If you want to do another tear down and I'll talk about other topics, we can do that because these are the issues people struggle with. And if you can avoid these, if you can go back to my notes and understand what we talked about and keep these and avoid these issues and build better, you will have better models and you will be, you know, um, really well received 
on your teams by being able to, you know, have great decision making tools. So thanks for having me and Luke. It's great to be back. Yeah. Again, Ian, always, always a pleasure. You're, you're, I think, I think the community really appreciates your content and, and really learns so much from you in, in, the, in the span of an hour. So always happy to have you uh, come back again. Um, thank you everybody for who joined. We really, really appreciate it. Um, we run webinars every single month, so please make sure to stay tuned. Um, we're also trying to do our best to improve our webinars. So you're going to see in the chat, there will be a link where you can give your feedback. It's a two question survey. It'll take you less than five seconds. And we really, really appreciate your, your feedback um, to make sure that we are delivering the best quality um, in terms of webinars. Um, so as Ian mentioned, there will be an email after this with the recording. Um, so you can rewatch all of your favorite parts. Um, and if you have any questions, I, you can also contact Ian directly. Um, like he said, he's happy to review also your financial models. So, so please feel free to use that as a resource. Um, and that's it for, from us. Any, any final words, Ian, from, from your end? I just sent a quick note in the chat to Eva, who had a question for me on, on repeating, if there was confusion. When I said repeat assumptions, when I, when I said to repeat assumptions very quickly, um, I, I don't mean to copy them but to link them back so if you link it back then you and you change the first one it will flow through properly of course it has to flow through um copying the value would be a disaster i agree you need to link it uh yeah there's lots to talk about uh take a look at what i've got um and um yeah link and copy or just press equals and link back here manually but uh happy to chat happy if you want to connect on linkedin happy to kind of share modeling best practices as we go and and then if you're interested in joining us at fmi you will learn to ensure that you have modeling best practices and that you really don't make these mistakes. Um, that's part of what we're doing at, at FMI these days is helping people elevate their skills. So thanks, Luke. Great to meet all of you again. And I look forward to seeing you again. Perfect. Uh, have, a, have a good day, everybody. And see you on the next one. Take Bye -bye. care, everybody. Be well.